Not so long ago, Sunday was still a special day. Businesses were forbidden to operate, in many businesses, by blue laws. However, this has all seemed to have been changed. Now, shoppers flock to malls on Sundays. People do most of their grocery shopping off on Sundays as well. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. On the other hand, there is a commandment, keep holy the Lord's day. Discussing this commandment in light of this new social situation we have is Father Clarence Kelly. Father Kelly, welcome to What Catholics Believe. Pleasure to be here. Father Kelly, why did God make this commandment, keep holy the Lord's day? He made it uh, for a number of reasons, uh, two of which would be to protect men, okay, to give them an opportunity to rest, uh, and uh, the other reason, which is uh, a greater reason, is because it is necessary to acknowledge the Creator. And so God specified that one day out of seven would be set aside for men to do that. Mm -hmm. How do we observe this commandment of keeping holy the Lord's day? And what's going to happen to those who don't? We do it uh, in two ways. One is uh, by not doing something, and the other is by doing something. What, what is it that we must do, and what is it that we shouldn't do? What we should not do is we should not engage in servile work. Uh, that's what we should not do. What we should do is we should uh, attend Mass uh, on Sunday and uh, render to God public homage. What is, what is meant by servile labor? What, what do we mean by this? Servile labor generally means uh, physical type labor. Uh, or it, it even refers to such things as legal work, for example, a judge sitting in a court or an attorney uh, arguing a case before the court. It's uh, work, for example, like mowing the lawn or uh, uh, laborious type work. Mm -hmm. What, uh, you said physical work, what about someone who is a, a businessman? and he goes into his business establishment, would this come under the proscription? It would, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what is proscribed would be physical work, business, and uh, judicial processes. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the, in the Gospels, uh, on a Sunday, on a Sabbath day, actually it was a Saturday, uh, an ill person was brought to our Lord, and our Lord asked the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And there was silence. And then he responded by saying, which one of you, if he had an ass fall into a pit, would not take him out on the Sabbath? How are we to understand this passage from Holy Scripture? As is the general rule, people violate the laws of God or the virtues by going to one or the other extreme. Uh, for example, the virtue of obedience requires submission to the lawful commands of a legitimate superior but it also requires resisting unlawful commands on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it requires uh, uh, not, uh, not rebelling against those commands. But in the case of the, the commandment of God, which is not only what's called a positive law of God, it is also based on the natural law, there are two ways to violate it. One way would be the way the scribes and Pharisees did. That is to say, they would institute certain practices which would go contrary to the spirit of the law. And the other way to violate it is what is being done in our society today, which is the other extreme, and that is to deprive the law of any force whatsoever mm -hmm. and to reduce uh, the Sabbath day of the New Testament, which is Sunday, to just another day. So there are two extremes. You mentioned this as an interesting point. The Sabbath day of the New Testament is a Sunday. Why did it become a Sunday instead of a Saturday? It became a Sunday because uh, of a number of reasons. Uh, basically, the reason was because the church made it so. Mm -hmm. The commandment of God uh, to keep holy the Sabbath day is not intrinsically tied to the seventh day. The word Sabbath, in fact, in Hebrew means cessation cessation. 
and that is to say the cessation of labor, cessation of work. The reason the church did it in the New Testament was because Sunday is the day of the resurrection of our Lord, uh, and because also the first day is the uh, first day of creation. And that first act of creation uh, is a type or figure for the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, important in the early years of the church to distinguish the practices of the Old Testament from those of the New Testament because there were many converts from Judaism to Christianity who wanted to impose the Mosaic Law mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Father, on a practical level, two questions. Uh, when may someone work on Sunday? For instance, it's clear that houses burn down on Sunday, people die on Sunday, so certainly it would seem legitimate that firemen should be able to work on Sunday, and uh, doctors, say, should work on Sunday. But at the other hand, when may we refuse to work on Sunday? Because as we mentioned at the onset, there's a, a tendency for businesses to remain open seven days a week. Uh, grocery stores open on Saturday. His competitor starts opening Sunday. He loses the customer. He's forced to open on Sunday in order to remain competitive and maintain his livelihood. What extent of a, of a person is working in some establishment and his boss says, we have an emergency, I want you to come in on Sunday, and he's somewhat uh, solicitous about his job, should he come in on Sunday or he should say, no, look, I don't see any justification for doing this kind of work on Sunday, it's just going to have to wait. What's, uh, what's the answer to this dilemma? The answer is the word necessary, that if it is truly necessary work, then it, it's not the intention of God to prohibit it. That was, in a certain sense, the excess of the scribes and Pharisees. Mm -hmm. so, uh, with regard to a specific problem like that, if you had a boss that insisted that you work Sunday and you expressed to him your desire not to work, but that it, w it would involve some potential danger to you as far as your job goes, then certainly you would be able to work in a case like that. Mm -hmm. However, let us say your boss said, I want some volunteers for overtime on Sunday, then you certainly could not volunteer unless there was some grave need. And by grave need, I don't mean like a second car mm -hmm. or a new TV. Mm -hmm. I mean some legitimate grave need, then you could volunteer in a case like that. It's, it's all in the, the, uh, the understanding of the word necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the way modern commerce operates, it's, it seems there's deadlines, pressure, and competition. And in the United States, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, very rare for business establishments to be open on Sunday. Uh, how is it that things weren't so grave then, but they are grave now? Uh, they are not more grave now, but rather what we have is the manifestation in a practical way of this fundamental revolt against God. Mm -hmm. What men are really saying to God is, we just don't have time for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we consider it to be uh, an infringement of our liberty for you to expect us not to make a few bucks on Sunday. Mm -hmm. and that's, what it, that's what it's basically rooted in, the secularization of America and uh, the rejection of the influence of the, of, uh, of the supernatural order. You know, I, I'm sure that uh, in certain societies which are foreign to us, say Islam, uh, Pakistan, for instance, India, uh, maybe even certain Buddhist segments of, of Japan or China, mm -hmm. uh, if they were to work, uh, violate on their holy day, violate the holy day, I'm sure that would cause a tremendous outcry. Uh, in this country, again, getting back to practical situation, what, to, how does one decide, say, when something is necessary? For instance, a deadline. We promised this company or this man such and such a thing by Monday, and by Saturday it's still not done. How in general would, would it be expected that this man would understand that Sunday is the holy day and you would not want him to violate a holy day in order to meet his deadline? Or would it be such that you want that deadline met, let him violate the Sunday? How, how does one react to that situation? I would say don't make any promises unless you're sure you can deliver. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, don't put yourself in a situation where you readily would have to violate the, the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to add, though, that it's far more significant than most people understand. Most people think of it simply as, well, 
you know, we used to not work on Sunday and now we work on Sunday and maybe it's unfortunate, but it's just the way life goes. It's far more significant. Perhaps you can get into the significance. What, what does this mean? Well, in the Old Testament, God said in the book of Deuteronomy that keeping the Sabbath day was the sign of your relationship to me and my relationship to you. It's a sign and a seal of this relationship. And therefore, the rejection of that, that public rejection of God's day, is a rejection of that relationship. Here is uh, what it says in the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, the 15th verse. It says, See that you keep my Sabbath, because it is a sign between me and you in your generation that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctify you. The keeping of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think clearly the, uh, the, the implication is that if you do not keep the Sabbath, then you are destroying the sign and ultimately the reality of your relationship to me. I think that's what's happened in America. I think America is as we've mentioned before on another program, America is going through a transition now from the post-Christian to the anti-Christian era. Now people don't even bat an eyelash about violating the Sabbath. There's no outrage. There's no sense of a jealousy, so to speak, a holy jealousy for the rights of God. Just accept it. You know, this uh, is another question I have in relation to this. Why is it that following Vatican II, Catholics can now apparently satisfy their Sunday obligation by going to Mass on Saturday. <laughs> they can do it because the hierarchy uh, made that law. The question is, why did the hierarchy make that law? What is the effect of it? And uh, I think they made the law, if for no other reason than because they have lost their sense of, uh, of the supernatural order and of the sacred. And the effect of it, of course, is to communicate that to people. Mm -hmm. I haven't had sort of an interesting story, sort of amusing. I have an aunt, uh, two, two. One of them is dead, God rest his soul. But one of them went to the traditional mass, and the other went to the local church. One lived upstairs, the other lived downstairs. Mm -hmm. Now, because there was no traditional mass available in the area, the one who went to the traditional mass only went to mass on fairly rare occasions when she was able to get a ride out to Long Island. And the other one, of course, went across the street to the parish church every single day. So this was a source of conflict between the two of them. And the one that went to the local parish church one day criticized my aunt, who didn't go to the local parish church or the new mass, would only go to the traditional mass. And she criticized her by saying to her, you're a pagan. And the reason you're a pagan is because you don't go to mass on Sunday. And the reaction of the traditional uh, aunt was this. She said, well, look at you. You go to the local new mass every single day of the week. And on Saturday, you go twice. You go in the morning uh, for Saturday, and then you go Saturday afternoon for Sunday. And the only day of the week you don't go to church is on Sunday. Hmm. <laughs> and it was true. It was the only day she didn't how how does does a, the, the church have the power? Well, obviously it does to move the Sabbath from like Sunday to Saturday because it, it, it did it once from Saturday to Sunday. So it certainly seems that this is legitimate. But my question is is that it seems that this move is a part of the accommodation of the Catholic Church to the modern world, rather than setting a standard. No. This is the way it is. The world must conform to the church. We see the church saying, ah, yes, our faithful have many difficulties. Let us make it easier for them by making this on Saturday. Uh, do you think there's any merit to, uh, to this? I don't think they're saying that they've changed uh, the Sabbath of the New Testament back to Saturday. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're saying that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they would even presume to to say that, mm -hmm. although they might. Mm -hmm. You never know. They have presumed to change the words of our Lord at the consecration of the Mass, so you never know. They might presume to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think what they're saying is, they're saying is we're, we're uh, trying to make it easier for people that the Sabbath begins at sundown, mm -hmm. as it sort of did in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but it, it, it really, uh, it, it really is 
uh, a lack of respect with regard to themselves for the Sabbath of the New Testament. And of course, it's, it's a lack of a pastoral sense, too. The, this is supposed to be the age of uh, the pastoral council and everything. But I think there is an abysmal lack of a pastoral spirit because they either don't understand or do not see that the effect of doing this is to destroy all reverence for a Sunday. You know, uh, St. John Vianney once said that if the best way of becoming poor is to work on Sundays. This was a statement, and I mean, he might have meant that you, you might prosper materially, but spiritually you'd starve yourself. Why is it that uh, the church uh, places uh, obligation of assisting at Mass with mortal, uh, under mortal sin, under pain of mortal sin? Out of uh, the love of God and the love of the salvation of souls, uh, the church knows the frailty of human nature and the inclination to sin and to the easy way out. And so the church says that we're going to make this a serious obligation in order to ensure that the faithful will pursue their own spiritual welfare. So the church does it for that reason. That's the reason we need law. We need law because of the inclination to the easy way out, the inclination to sin. And so the law, uh, so to speak, fortifies and strengthens those who would not otherwise do uh, the best thing in this case. What is it uh, of the, the Sunday obligation? Uh, we, we saw that uh, under certain in instances, uh, one could work on Sunday. For instance, a fireman, a policeman, a doctor. What about the Sunday obligation? Can one ever uh, ignore it? Under what conditions could one ignore it? Well, I wouldn't say they could ignore it, but I would say that there are instances in which it does not oblige. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if, uh, say, a son or a daughter had a very sick mother at home and she was so sick that she could not be left alone, then obviously the church would not intend uh, that she ignore the demands of charity and piety uh, to fulfill this obligation. And so they, they would not bind. There would be sort of a conflict of laws, the law of charity versus the prescription which obliges us to attend Mass on Sunday. The church would not intend mm -hmm. that the person would have to go to Mass on Sunday. However, uh, I think maybe what you might be getting at is that the purpose of the ecclesiastical law is to see that the divine law uh, and the natural law is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are creatures of God. God is our creator. He is the author of life. And uh, he uh, has a right to expect from us obedience and reverence and respect and love. And, uh, and therefore, one way of expressing this is to keep holy the Sabbath day. In the New Testament, it's by assisting at Mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation. But the purpose of the law, the purpose of the law in that case the, uh, is not only the good of man, but also to render homage to God. And therefore, if the only way to do that would be to attend a religious service that was irreverent or disrespectful or that deprived God of his external honor or glory, then you would be obliged uh, not to attend that. Mm -hmm. For example, the new mass. Mm -hmm. You know, Father, I think that uh, one thing I comment I'd like to make, and I appreciate your reaction to this, is that uh, some people, especially after the Second Vatican Council, seem to take very lightly the obligation of assisting Mass. And I think what lies at the bottom of this is that they take the Mass very lightly because, no, well, their pastors take it very lightly. How significant is the Mass on Sunday? You know, St. Leonard said that, uh, compared that uh, the Mass to be the, uh, what keeps the world in order. And if the Mass would suddenly stop being said and throughout the whole world, it would be much worse than if the sun quit shining. And he even gave an example of, uh, of the wrath of God, which, which manifested itself over, comparatively speaking, minor transgressions in the Old Testament, but now is restrained and the most horrible things are happening and which almost dwarf the abuses of the Old Testament and nothing is done. What's your view on this and how significant is the Mass? 
I think to really understand it, you have to first go back to the Old Testament. You have to see the type or the figure in order to understand the reality. And the type of figure that we had in the Old Testament was Moses leading the chosen people from bondage in Egypt to liberty uh, in the promised land, the land of Canaan. And uh, what happened? What happened was is the Jews were enslaved. Uh, God then visited a series of plagues upon Egypt. The final plague was the, the death of the firstborn. God sent the angel of death uh, to visit this wrath upon the people. The chosen people were protected when they took uh, the innocent lambs and slew them and painted the blood of the lambs over the doorpost of their homes. And the angel of death came by. He saw the blood and passed over. And as a result of that, the Jews passed over from the slavery of Egypt to the liberty of the promised land. Uh, they did it first by passing through the waters of the Red Sea, figure for baptism, by the way. When they were in the desert, they were fed with manna from heaven, figure for the Holy Eucharist. But the point is that these figures uh, were, were types for what would happen in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have the true Moses, who is the incarnate Word of God, the eternal Son of God become man. He is our lamb. He is the lamb of God. He is put to death. His blood is poured out. In virtue of the shedding of his blood, we are saved. But we have to have access to that blood. Just because Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, it doesn't mean we're saved. We are redeemed in the sense that he has paid the penalty for the sins of men. He died once for all upon the cross. But we must now have access to that blood. And the access we have to that blood is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is the renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. Mm -hmm. We receive the blood of Christ uh, in the Holy Eucharist, his body and his blood. His blood is, in a certain mystical way, painted over the doorpost of our souls through the reception of the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So the Mass is supreme. Mm -hmm. The Mass is the channel through which the graces won on Calvary are poured out to a sinful world. That's why the Mass is so important. You know, we live in a very materialistic world which almost denies the supernatural. And we take eating, living, you know, breathing for granted. But we look at, we don't consider the life of the soul. And we don't, we would never consider starving ourselves of food. And yet, if by mass, not participating at mass, we essentially starve our souls of its food, of its ability to withstand fallen nature and temptation and to live justly. Uh, it seems when St. Leonard wrote his book, uh, Hidden Treasure of the Holy Mass, his whole purpose was to make the mass much more appreciated, and in a sense, the, the Sabbath much more appreciated as well. And he gave examples of, of people who, for instance, one day they didn't hear mass out of, and something terrible would befall them, just to illustrate how important this is. Uh, what's your view? Uh, how, how would you convey to someone the importance of, 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 of this thing, of the, the great significance of what's happening in Holy Mass? Well, in, in the modern world, it's difficult. It's very difficult with Catholics who have sort of absorbed uh, this new theology of uh, of the modernist. It's very difficult with them. It's also very difficult with well-meaning Protestants. I think probably the best way, or one of the best ways anyway, a better way, is to go back to the words of our Lord, to go to uh, sacred scripture, to find out what is it exactly that the Son of God taught. And if we go back, for example, to the, uh, the scene in the, uh, in the upper room at the Last Supper, where our Lord institutes the holy sacrifice of the mass he is fulfilling in reality what moses did in the old testament moses uh, took the blood of the covenant held the book sprinkled the people with the blood and said this is the blood of the covenant when our lord instituted the holy sacrifice of the mass he used words almost identical to the words used by moses now that's an indication of the new testament covenant sacrifice and then of course in the gospel of saint john the sixth chapter, 
we have the beautiful sermon of our Lord on the Holy Eucharist, words that could not possibly be clearer, the most clear words in all of sacred scripture. If anything is clear from sacred scripture, it is that in the Holy Eucharist, we have the body, the blood, the soul, and divinity of our Lord. He taught it explicitly, clearly, and he taught it as a matter of precept. So that's what I would say to all many non-Catholics and, I suppose, to modern Catholics. Read what our Lord said. He said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. <laughs> Father Kelly, on the last note, just uh, how did those particular friends of God, the saints, how did they spend their Sundays? I'm not talking about contemplatives, but people in the active life, such as St. Teresa's father or someone like this, or even... Uh, you know, St. Louis, King of France. What did they do especially on Sunday? They recognized, first of all, that it was the day set aside for the creature in a most special way to, to deal with the Creator. And so their lives uh, revolved around the church, around the liturgy of the church, Mass in the morning, for example, and Vespers in the afternoon, the Sermon in the afternoon benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. In other words, it, it was all for God. Christ was the center. They spent many hours in church, in other words, not just 45 minutes an hour, 15 minutes at Mass, but the whole day centered around that. The whole day, even the time they were not in church, was lived relative to what they did in church. It's not the day you washed the car, in other words. That's correct. Right. It's the day that you commune in a most special way with the eternal Son of God. Now, Father Kelly, this has been a very interesting...